There is a reason that I have multiple chapters in my book, Growing Joy, about seed starting. Plant friends, I don't know if there's a more joyful or empowering experience than successfully taking a dormant little seed, a little speck, germinating it, seeing it sprout, and nurturing it into a healthy version of the plant that it was destined to become. It is truly magic to watch a plant go from seed to its full embodiment in front of your eyes. And if you also get to harvest something edible off of it at the end, it's even more rewarding. So this episode, which focuses on seed starting, is a doozy. And friends, if you are a houseplant parent or a gardener that's never tried seed starting before, today's episode, I'm going to gently and lovingly encourage you to try this incredible practice with one seed this year. Take a leap, you can do it. And if you're a gardener or experienced seed starter who really already knows the basics, we've got so much rich information to share with you. And let's be real, our guest today, Joe Lample, is a gift to the world of gardening and spending an hour with him is just a treat. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Welcome back, plant friends, to Growing Joy. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. I hope you've cultivated tons of joy with your plants and with nature. If you've been loving the episodes that we've been putting out for you, I would be so thankful if you took two minutes to leave us a review on your preferred podcast player, ideally iTunes. They really do help the show, and I appreciate it in advance. I wanted to open up this episode with a quick shout out to another female entrepreneur who I admire. I love Jessica Zweig and all of the incredible work that she's done with the Simply Be book and branding agency. I read Jessica's book, Be a No Bullshit Guide to Increasing Your Self-Worth and Net Worth by Simply Being Yourself last year, this time last year, and I have gone back to her book three times already in the last year as I've rebranded because she is the go-to guide for branding, whether it's branding yourself or branding your business, but she does it through such a beautifully spiritual lens. It's just such a good read, and we're celebrating this week. She launched the companion workbook for her book, and her book has also launched in paperback. So I'm going to let you know about a three-day challenge that she's offering you at the end of today's episode. But so you know, the links to her incredible book, which I can't recommend enough. I literally buy it for all of my friends, all of my entrepreneurial friends. The links for that are going to be in the show notes. So congratulations, Jessica. Okay, seed starting. Plant friends, I have to be honest with you. It's like one of my favorite skills I've developed over the last three years in plant parenthood. I've I've had house plants. I've grown edible plants from seedlings. And I started seeds once in my tiny apartment in New York City and then got more into it when I moved upstate. And gosh, it's kind of a thing of its own, right? Like it's a whole separate aspect of gardening. It's a whole separate aspect of plant parenthood, which I talk about with Joe Lample, today's guest of joegardener.com, growing a greener world. He's like a pillar of the gardening community and a huge gardening personality. But seed starting is just so joyful and so interesting, and it helps you connect with your plants on such a deeper level. And it's really a lifelong skill. You know, my first, we talk about this in the episode, but your first year of seed starting looks different than your second year of seed starting looks different than your third year. And it's something that you can really build upon for the rest of your life. There's always a different seed you can try germinating. There's always a different tomato plant to try growing. And so I'm so excited to bring this conversation and this episode to you. There's no one else I would want to have a conversation about seed starting with than with Joe Lample, because I'm actually a graduate of his seed starting class, Master Seed Starting. I took it two years ago. The first time I was starting seeds, I watched the entire thing, took copious notes, followed everything he told me to do. And then I retook it again last year when I was starting seeds again. Joe is an incredible educator. He's got a ton of classes. I think I've probably taken all of them. They're all digital courses. I've taken most of them. And so when I wanted to do a seed starting episode, I knew Joe was going to be my guy to talk about it because he's truly the expert. And if you stay tuned at the end of the episode, we're going to let you know how you can get $100 off Master Seed Starting which launches this week, which is the course I was just talking about. But anyway, we got so much ground to cover, so why don't we dive right in? 
Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, Joe. Your first appearance on Growing Joy instead of Bloom and Grow Radio. I, Growing Joy has a really nice ring to it, Maria. I, I was playing that through my head when you told me, you know, the the rebranding name, and I thought, Growing Joy, that's so clever. I mean, it makes it's you. It's so perfect for you, and I love that name. So, congratulations. Aw, thanks. Fun fact, with the podcast art, we like designed the podcast art to have it say Growing Joy, and I showed it to a podcast mentor of mine. He was like, you should put With Maria under Growing Joy because people are going to think that you're Joy, and this is like a pregnancy podcast. (laughs) So that's the reason why we have With Maria on the podcast No, I think that's good. Not confuse anyone. (laughs) That's a good idea. That was smart. I love it. Yeah. Well, welcome back. I'm so excited to do this episode on seed starting. Mm. Do you want to give yourself a really quick introduction for people who might not know who you are, even though how dare they if they don't know (laughs) who Joe Lampel of Joe Gardner is? Okay, a deep breath here. Let me just try to do this quickly. So I am the um, creator and founder of JoeGardner.com and the Joe Gardner Show podcast, creator of the Online Gardening Academy. And I am the host and founder of Growing a Greener World, a national PBS television series. And um, I always forget something, but there's something else in there too. But podcast, as you mentioned, as I mentioned the podcast, podcast right after JoeGardner.com, oh, okay. and Growing a Greener World, the Online Gardening Academy, and seeds. Your and oh, yeah, it's well, the Online yeah, Gardening Academy, yeah. and the host of the most amazing seed starting class. Yeah, yeah, all those courses under the Online Gardening Academy, they're all in there. So yes. Yeah. And whenever I interview you, it's so funny because you're my friend, but you're also my teacher. Mm. And so these interviews are weird because I kind of like (laughs) fangirl over you a little bit. But we've just spent the last, you know, 45 minutes before we started the recording catching up talking about our lives. So it's always funny when I have to click into like student Maria, you know, of Joe, because I'm a graduate of the Garden Academy. I've taken all your courses multiple times. Mm -hmm. Whenever it's time to do some sort of gardening education, you're the first person I always call to to see, hey, do you have a course on this? Hmm. And um, this will actually be the third year I take seed starting. Yeah. I think I took it my first – I took it my first time in 2020 when I – was going to do seed starting for the first round. Mm -hmm. That's when I was like learning. I had no idea how to start seeds. I was only in tropical houseplants. Mm -hmm. And you walked me through as a beginner. Then I returned to it last year as I wanted to do some seed starting indoors because I was like going crazy. It was April and it was still snowing out by me. And I just like needed to start some seeds. And I remember I retook the class. I think I might have watched it at like a faster pace, Mm -hmm. but I took it again. Mm -hmm. And now I'm planning on doing it again because I feel like every time you take it, you learn something new. And we add to it all the time. We're always Mm -hmm. adding to it and updating it too. So there's going to be things that you will see this time that you didn't see before, which is good. Exactly. And I also think, you know, seed starting can be, and I remember this from my experience, it's really intimidating. Mm. Even if you are a gardener, like even if you've been a gardener or you're a houseplant parent and you just bought a house and you're doing your first garden, it feels like a whole new ball game. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's different media you have to use. There's Mm -hmm. different, you know, you need a heating mat. Like you need these things that you don't need with your houseplants or with, you know, seedlings that you buy at the garden center. Yeah. And I know that I waited a long time to start to try seed starting because I was intimidated, but man, it's so good. Once you start, you can't stop. This is true. And if you're a geek or even have a little geekiness in you, when you get into the lighting segment and talk about that, there is so much. And you know, from talking to Leslie Halleck in the past and, and you have a good sense of what all is involved with that. And you can go down a super rabbit hole trying to, you know, figure out the best lighting. So we spent a lot of time on that, but, um, I just, I, there's a, the big geek in me. So that mm-hmm. was like a favorite section of the course for me, but, um, that's when you can really bring value to it. When people, as you said, are often intimidated by the simple act of starting seeds. Yeah. Well, that's just the big tip of the iceberg. That's just compared the tip to, of the iceberg. Yeah. Totally. So why don't, before we dive in, so at the end of this episode, I want everyone listening to just go buy one seed packet and try one seed, just just to watch the miracle of watching a seed sprout into a little green cotyledon. Mm. But before that, why, why should people start seeds? Why should it not be intimidating? What are the reasons why you see your students and gardeners that you know starting seeds instead of seedlings? 
uh, for options on what they can grow. You know, if you don't start your own seeds, but you want to grow food in your garden or in a container somewhere, you're at the mercy of whatever the store decides to sell you as a seedling. But mm -hmm. if you have a favorite heirloom variety, tomato or yep. watermelon or something that harkens back to a special memory or something you said, I got to have that again. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes the only way you can get that is to find the seed and grow it yourself. So that's mm -hmm. one reason. Secondly, you're taking even more control over what's going into your body and how you produce what you're growing uh, as a steward to the earth and as to your body. Um, even when you buy organic seeds, you know, if we went to a store or a garden center and bought a plant, unless we were buying it as an organic certified organic seedling, how that was grown before we got it was probably just pounded with chemicals. Even the parent plant that provided the seed that made that seedling that you have was hammered with all kinds of pesticides and herbicides and fungicides to keep it as healthy as it could be to produce the seed. That was the crop that that farmer mm -hmm. was growing to grow out the seedling. So we're not even thinking, most people don't think about the fact that all of that work in, in chemicals upstream from before you ever took possession of it is, mm -hmm. is not good. And so we have the opportunity as gardeners, you know, and, and collectively we are a huge number more than ever now to make a difference there and support the companies that are producing seeds that are grown organically. And, and then we can continue to carry that torch forward. You know, if you care about stewardship or making this place a better than you found it, you know, starting your own seeds and doing it organically is very important. Absolutely. And to go back 100%, everything you just said, to go back to what you were talking about, about this variety, yeah, that was something that I don't think I even understood until I started starting seeds. Mm -hmm. Because when you're the gardener who only goes to the store and gets the seedlings, yep. you think that there are like five types of tomatoes, like big boy, early girl. Rutgers, um, yeah, beefsteak. Right. Like there's Beef steak, yeah, and yeah. Roma, right? Yeah. Like that's all you can find. And then all of a sudden, the first time I – like we should just preface this by saying we're probably going to shout out Territorial Seed Company a lot yeah. on this uh, this episode. But when I started working with Territorial Seed Company and I looked at their tomato catalog and I saw all of the different varietals that you could grow <laughs> – I didn't even know that was a thing, right? Like I didn't even know the variety available to us. And now, you know, I like, I don't want to say I now, well, I just, I can't unsee what I've seen now as a seed, <laughs> as someone who's learned to start seeds, you know? I'm laughing because this is such a timely conversation as, as you saw me maybe looking back to grab some things at, I mean, this day in these past few days, Toby, my farm manager and I have been cataloging the different um, varieties of tomato seedlings that I grew last year. And this is a two page all the way down inventory yeah. of what we sold oh and what God. we grew. And these are just each line item is a different variety of tomato, just tomatoes and a different variety. And that's just two pages. And then we did or a, you know, a shorthand version of an inventory of what I still have left over seed packs because I'm in the process of doing all my ordering. But again, you know, these are varieties that you are not going to find on the shelf at the garden mm -hmm. center. And this is what you want. And one more thing I forgot to say when you asked me why to grow your own seeds. I will tell you this. I've been gardening nearly all my life, and I've learned a lot over the years through professional training and just doing it for a living. But when you grow a plant from a seed, in that oh, six yeah. to eight weeks where it's in front of you, right before your eyes, that's the biggest transformation you're ever going to see from that plant over that period of time. And it all happens right in front of your face. And you learn more about gardening and, and plant care than mm -hmm. you're ever going to learn any other way. So if you just want to learn to be a better, smarter, more confident gardener, as I al always say, start start seeds. Don't be afraid to do it. They're genetically programmed to want to do what they're going to do. And you just have to provide the bare minimum and it's going to happen. But you're going to be in awe of what happens over that time. 
Yes. Oh my gosh. What you just said um, reminded me that they're genetically programmed. The first time I started seeds, I watched your, you know, I watched your course. I got my good soil. I got everything ready. And I was just so stressed. Like I was so nervous I was going to do it wrong. <laughs> I think also in part, I, you know, talking about it publicly, you know, showing showing my my first seed starting journey. And I was on a call with my mom who's, you know, longtime gardener. Yes. She was like, Maria, <laughs> the seeds are going to do what the seeds are going to do. Just put them in the dirt Mama and get Maria. out of the way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So she was just like, gosh. And then also, you know, if we're talking about the name of this podcast, Growing Joy, I don't know if it gets more joyful. Ooh. I don't know if there is any more, like, from a wellness perspective, taking a seed in your hand that looks like the speck of dirt and watching it turn into a plant that then you nurture over a long period, uh, you know, a few months, and then it rewards you with fruit or its leaves or however you're going to eat it. Like, there is no cooler experience. And this goes with edibles or not. Like I grew dahlias from tubers yeah, last yeah, summer. Yeah, yeah. And like the joy that those dahlias gave me. I mean, it's just, there's just a different empowerment that you feel when you're, when you're starting from seed that, that you can still have a beautiful experience starting from seedlings if that's what's available to you. Um, because you know, that's how I grew. I, that's my first few gardens was just seedlings on my balcony. But, um, you know, if if it's available to you, if you have the curiosity, I think Joe and I are totally obviously biased, but man, listen, um, you're all in when you grow a pack of seeds in a in mm -hmm. a tray, and you've gone to the effort, and it's not much to get the tray and put mm -hmm. the soil in and pop the seed on top and water it in and put the humidity dome on top. Tell me if I'm wrong about this. And I've been doing this now for a very long time. I, I'm i more excited about seed starting this season than I was last season. And next 100%. season, I'll be more excited than I am this season. And so it just doesn't get any more exciting and it doesn't get old. But Maria, you know this, I'm sure. When you put those seeds in and you, you set them out to germinate, did mm -hmm. you not like check them that day that you sowed the Every seeds hoping that day. they would pop yeah. up, you know, like right then, even Twice though you know day. it's going to take like five or 10 days, but you're, mm -hmm. you can't separate yourself from it. You were all in and yeah. uh, it's a, it's an amazing experience. I have a hydroponic garden in my living room right now and I'm experimenting with starting that from seeds. So I'm not buying the hydroponic seedlings and I, I set up some seeds on January 1st and every 12 hours mm -hmm. I am at that hydroponic planter, the tomato, I'm growing dwarf tomatoes, yeah. which by the way, you can't find in the garden center. I had to order the seeds. Right. Territorial Seed Company has a kitchen garden for small gardeners. You know, there's been amazing advancements in dwarf plants. Mm -hmm. Like you can grow six inch tomato plants now. And so micro yeah, dwarfs. I'm stuck. Yeah. Micro dwarfs. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Micro dwarfs. Yeah. Yeah. Every day I'm just like checking it in the morning and at mm -hmm. night to see, okay, have the tomatoes sprouted? Of and course. then I'm like, you put it in today, Maria. You got to relax. <laughs> okay. I also gardener to gardener. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to throw something at you and see what you think. Hit me. I think I'm going to trademark this. <laughs> I think there's something called, or I've named something called gardener's itch. Mm. And gardener's itch comes when you're in the Northeast oh. about a month before you start your seeds. And, or like if it's been for me, you know, I started experiencing gardener's itch in April. It had been dark and snowing for four months here. And I started to get so itchy. Like I needed to get my hands in the dirt. I needed to start see, yeah. seeing things grow. Totally. And I found, I found myself. So I think gardener's itch is a syndrome that gardeners get hmm. when you're just like waiting for the growing season and you can't like handle it. And seeds are a great way to... It's Oh. Seeds are my prescription for gardener's itch. It is it's it is the prescription. It's um yeah. There's nothing else that you can really do other than if you wanted to grow hydroponically or aeroponically on a countertop or whatever. That's a great mm -hmm. thing. But for those who are, you know, outdoor growers and mm -hmm. they're they have cabin fever. That's a, akin mm -hmm. to gardener's itch is they're inside and it's snowing and it's cold and it's January and they just can't stand the fact that they can't get out there. But they can get their hands in the dirt and by starting seeds. And that's how you scratch that itch is mm -hmm. to start those seeds. So you're right on it. And uh, there's no 
you know, there, there, there's no coincidence that all the seed catalogs start hitting our mailbox the week after Christmas. It's like they know Gardner's Itch is coming. They know. And we're ready to open those catalogs and place those orders, as I did all the last week and through today. Do you read seed catalogs like they're magazines? Because I do. They, I, they, there's the, you know, the better seed catalogs are like uh, textbooks. I mean, if you really read them and yeah. learn, you can get the story of the seed. You can learn about you know, nuances of those varieties. And there's a wealth of information in there. Uh, and I think oftentimes people don't take the time to read that information and they're just glossing through, but they're missing opportunities for free education. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you love Farmer's Almanac as well? What do you think about Farmer's Almanac? I don't get it. I, I go to it online and I look at it there, but I don't mm-hmm. I don't go – that's not a go-to source for me, although I know a mm-hmm. lot of people that use it. I just haven't used it in years, and gosh, there's no shortage of content out there. So it's, it's just a for matter sure. of how much we can consume, and that's just one that never gets surfaced up to the top of the list for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got it last year because it was like at a garden center yeah. or something, and I read it like a magazine. Yeah, and I I love it. I'm trying to go more analog. My my eyes mm-hmm. hurt from being on screens. All I, the time. I'm with you. <laughs> I, I I probably need to go pick up a copy of that because I'm a I love analog. <laughs> you know, I have a I have my planner that I write in, and then I mm-hmm. match it up with my my digital. <laughs> It's like, I love it. Okay. So let's talk about that. So planning, you mentioned your planner. Well, I think the most intimidating thing about seed starting and also something that personally three years in, I'm still struggling with a little bit is keeping track of all your seeds Hmm. because it's not a seedling that you're buying pre-grown sticking in the ground or in a pot. And then you're watching it. You're starting like sometimes hundreds of seeds, they all look the same to begin with. You've got to properly label them. Mm -hmm. You have to know the timing. Like there's a lot of organization that goes into seed starting that normal gardeners, non-seed gardeners need. So can you kind of give us that? Because I know you're both analog and digital with your approach. It's easy to get overwhelmed. And Mm -hmm. when you start ordering packs of seeds – or pick them up in the store and order them. Before you know it, it doesn't take long before you literally have hundreds, dare I say, thousands of seed packs. And, yeah. you know, literally this is just, this is real time. This is me. It's not a, it's just a coincidence. It wasn't like I planned this, but I mean, this is just one. Oh, look at that. That's like a briefcase full of plastic boxes filled with seeds. Yeah. I mean, we, we, are those cassette tape holders? They are photo holders, like at Michael's oh, or photo craft stores. Holders. Okay. But they come in five by seven cases. But we, I have stacks of these suit, basically these suitcases for all our different varieties of crops mm-hmm. and flowers. I mean, we have a section for flowers, a section for edibles, a section for peppers, a section for tomatoes. It's like crazy when you, when you build up like that, but it's organization. My point is, until we got organized like that, and when I say we, it's because I finally, you know, a couple of years ago got some help to get me organized because I was overwhelmed. Like, it's easy to yeah. do. But when you find a system, whatever that system is, to help you get your head around what you have and are the seeds even still viable? Uh, do you need to order more? Do you even know what you have so that you don't have to waste money ordering stuff you already have? You know, all that mm-hmm. stuff is made easier when you find a system that works for you, even if it's writing it down on a list, a spreadsheet, whatever it is for you. It makes all the world a difference. And and it gives you a little more peace of mind because, you know, Mother Nature is rolling out the calendar and she's not going to wait for you to get ready to get organized. It, spring is coming and it's going to be here before you know it. And with seed starting, you need to be about eight weeks ahead of that so that when spring does come, those seedlings are ready to go outside. And, and that comes down to planning. So you ask yourself, am I a planner or a planter? And if you're a planter, oh. you're you're behind the eight ball. You're you're chasing, you're reacting. You're reactive, mm-hmm. not you're not proactive. And so a planner is proactive, and that's being proactive. And there's a big difference, and that has a lot to do with the success that you have and the stressless environment that you're now in when you think ahead and you plan ahead. I could I could talk for days about that and, and how, how much of a difference that makes. But yes, it's very important, very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I have all the seed starting supplies I need. I have hundreds of bags of seeds at this, at this point, And I could easily, get, I have two roads I could go down this year. I could plan in advance. I could count out my frost date. I could sketch everything out. 
or I could do what I did last year, which was wait till late. Cause I didn't think I was going to start seeds last year, but then my gardener's itch got so bad in April. I just was like, Oh my God, what do I have in my seed box? Like I need to see something sprout. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of like flew by the seat of my pants for the whole experience mm -hmm. and it still worked, yeah. but, um, it was stressful. And I do think seed starting doesn't need to be intimidating or stressful. It can be totally joyful and you can have this kind of sense of control, you know, over it. So you mentioned going eight weeks out. Can we talk about mm -hmm. what does that planning look like? What do you need to know mm -hmm. in order to kind of set your seed starting calendar? Plan friends, if we're talking seed starting, we need to talk to you about Territorial Seed Company, one of our sponsors. They have everything you need for a successful seed starting journey this year. If you want to one-stop shop seed starting, it's going to be with Territorial Seed Company. So obviously they have an incredible variety of seeds. Whatever you want to grow, they probably have it for you and a wide variety of it. But let's talk about the gear. In this episode, Joe and I talk about all of the different gear that you need to successfully start seeds. And Territorial Seed Company also has all of the gear you need. Their 7-inch dome propagation kit comes with all of the stuff we talked about in the episode, like the seed starting tray, the 50-cell insert, the mesh bottom flat, and the humidity dome. Uh, so it's like a little mini greenhouse for your seedlings. They also have the seed germination heat mats, the grow lights that you need, and even the fancy seed counter that I obsess about oh, <laughs> with Joe. You can even make it insanely easy by trying their J7 peat pellets, which are little pellets of peat that you soak in water, they expand, they become both the pot and the soil for your seeds. And then you just plop those, those pellets right into the ground when you're ready to transplant to avoid transplant shock. I've started territorial seeds for the last three years. I love them. The germination rate is incredible with them. My favorite type of cherry tomato that they offer is the blush varietal. I also love their pineapple ground cherries. Those were delicious. I grew those with Melody a couple years ago. And all of their flower seeds. I grew a lot of their different wildflower mixes last year that did beautifully. And you get 10% off. So you can one-stop shop with them and then get 10% off your entire order. Go to territorialseed.com slash growing joy and you'll get 10% off applied at checkout. Once again, that's territorialseed.com slash growing joy for 10% off everything you need to start your seeds with success this year. Thank you to our longtime supporter, Espoma Organics. Synonymous with seed starting should be Espoma Organic seed starting mix. I love that Espoma Organic and Territorial Seed Company are like perfect co-sponsors for this episode because I usually start my territorial seeds in Espoma Organic seed starter mix. So Espoma is a family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. We know I love their liquid fertilizers. We know I love their houseplant potting mix. We know I love their houseplant liquid fertilizer, but man, their seed starting mix is amazing. I've used it for the last three years. And then once it's time to plant your started seeds in the ground, use their Biotone Starter Plus and then their accompanying mix for whatever you're growing in. So they have garden soil or they have potting mix or raised bed mix or container mix, depending on however you're what you're transplanting into. Anyway, whatever you need, Espoma has it. To learn more about their organic indoor and outdoor options for your plants, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are to go pick it up. Or you can click the link in the show notes to go to my Espoma Amazon storefront for a list of all of my favorite products. First thing you need to know is what's the, in, in spring, okay? Because that's, you know, we're coming into spring. And when we think about, sowing edibles we're probably thinking about our summer crops you know even though and we won't go there today but there's a lot of things that i'll be planting next month as seeds outside that are cool season crops that i can get stuff that doesn't grow in the summertime to sprout from a seed and harvest before it gets hot so that's kind of getting ahead of the system and that's probably for the next chapter of a seed starter's life but let's go back mm -hmm. to you know what makes the most sense for today. And that is thinking about what we can plant in springtime. And the key date 
is your last risk of frost date because many of the seeds that we sow that are going to grow in warm weather are sensitive to the frost. And so you don't want them to be sprouting and outside and it's still cold and then a frosty night comes and it kills off your seedling. So Mm -hmm. what we want to do, though, is bump up against that. and, And once we know, according to the predictions, when that last risk of frost is for the area that we live in, and it's a, it's an instant Google search if you put that term in, you're going to find out that date for your area. And then so what you're doing is you're starting your seeds approximately, I said eight weeks, somewhere between six and eight weeks in general for most seeds that we're sowing for warm season crops. They need that much time to sprout and grow enough and put on true leaves that photosynthesize and build their own energy so that they can handle the outdoor environment when it's warm enough. But we have to get past that last risk of frost date before we plant them outside safely. And it takes about six to eight weeks prior to that frost date that we need to be working on the growth of that. So that's why you work backwards from knowing that date, moving back into the earlier time of the year and do the math. And that's when you want to start planting your seeds inside. Okay. So I think uh, what I've learned in my only three years of seed starting is it's a very kind of fine line that you want to tread as well, because you kind of want to start er as early as possible because you want to get kind of kind of the earlier you start and the mu- the, the ease in which you can get them to harden off and transition outside, like the larger the plant is when you transplant it, hopefully you're going to get fruit a little bit earlier. Like the lar- the more time you can give the seed to grow, the better. But if you start it too early and the plant gets too large, you're actually also kind of setting it up for failure because it's not going to harden off And it's not going to be really prepared to thrive and then it'll just stop growing. So I will say like from experience, I would trust those whatever's on your seed packet and not try and cheat it because I've definitely tried to cheat it before. Have you ever successfully cheated? Yeah, but you got to You got to know how to cheat it so that you can get those grace nights or those grace days, you know, using row cover or covers over the tops of the plant so that you don't have them in contact with frost. So there's things that you can do, cloches and and cold frames and things. But Maria, you really brought up a good question or a good point because we're so eager to start those seeds early that we oftentimes, I think the mistake that many of us make, and it's not necessarily a mistake, but it's, you know, if you could start either too early or a little too late, I would encourage people to start a little too late and hold off Mm, because once the seedlings are outside, Mother Nature, again, with sun, with full yeah. sun, which you have no mm-hmm. way of replicating inside, mm-hmm. all you're trying to do while they're going inside is keep them healthy enough so that when you plant them outside, Mother Nature takes over. You're making the that's handoff. That's when they take off. And that's yeah. when they take off. And you can make up for a lot of lost time once they're in good soil and full sun in the proper water that you're really not going to miss any time at all. And your plants are actually going to be healthier. They're going to establish faster. But to your point, when we start early, we're doing that more for us than the plants. The plants don't need us to do that. Yeah. In fact, when we put them, keep them in an artificial growing environment for too long, we actually can stress them out and make them less healthy. And then we try to push them because they're not looking as good. So we give them supplemental fertilization inside, which is causing them to push growth that they don't have the environment to do because they're, they, you know, the chemicals are saying grow, 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 but they're, the plant's saying, well, I don't have enough good light for that. And I don't have enough room to spread my roots. And you're asking me to do stuff that I'm not really ready to do. And it mm-hmm. shows in the fact that the plant just doesn't look that good. Now, the consolation to that is, or the you can take comfort in saying, well, you know, I'm not submitting, I'm not entering these plants into the state fair. They don't have to look like prize winning seedlings. I just got to keep right. them alive and strong enough so that when I plant them, they're going to do fine. So they're yeah. slightly on the, the one thing, later than earlier. Totally. And one thing I messed up last year too, was that I didn't have a fan and those seedlings really need like they're not getting airflow. They're not getting rain. They're not getting all this stuff that is going to like harden them mm-hmm. off so that they have really sturdy bodies and can really, you know, go the distance of the summer. So step one, decide you're going to start seeds. Step two, figure out your frost date by Googling frost date and your zip code. Yep. It'll come up, figure out your garden zone, and then start counting, you know, understand eight to six weeks before your frost date is when you're going to start. Mm-hmm. 
Before we dive into how to start seeds, one question I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, are there plants that after trials and error, you've thought, you know what, these actually are better to just buy as seedlings. Like for a home gardener, these plants are are too hard uh, to start indoors. It's hard for me to think about buying a seedling today. You know, mm. as, as many seeds as I've sown, it it just rubs me the wrong way to have to go pay for a seedling when I know how to start that plant from seed yeah. okay. and take control over it. But that said, I am still having to buy a few plants every year because I forgot to get that variety of seed or um, I need that variety and I just didn't grow it this spring or this winter. So I'll go mm-hmm. buy it. And it, and it, and again, it just, I can just, I'm getting mad talking about it because they're expensive <laughs> and I, I could have done that, but you know, it's, it's okay. But the ones that you would want to buy as seedlings, if you're not doing them from seeds are, um, for me, it would be like the, um, cucurbits, like the melons or the cucumbers or the pumpkins or the winter squash, because they germinate quickly anyway outside. They're larger seeds and mm-hmm. they need warmer soil. And if we're starting those inside, you can do it, but there's really no point in doing it because if you just wait until it's warm soil outside after a couple weeks after that last risk of frost, they're not going to take up any room inside, which you could, you know, not everybody has unlimited space inside to grow what they want to grow. So figure out what you don't need to grow inside and either buy it as a seedling or sow it directly Mm -hmm. outside yourself into the soil rather than inside. And that's going to accomplish a lot of things and free up some space and buy you some time. And, you know, you learn that as you go, but the cucurbits are a good example. And I, I say that And again, I gave you the examples of what those plants are. Yeah, that's great. I feel like where I'm at, because I don't have a huge seed starting setup, I'm at this hybrid moment Mm -hmm. where, which is also kind of how my mom has always gardened is, you know, you figure out for me, it's like, I'm going to start tomatoes from seed because I've learned that variety. I'm not going to find elsewhere, but I might buy my, you know, I might buy some flowers already started so I could kind of enjoy them a little bit earlier. But I am in that process of trying to evaluate, like, what do I really want to start from seed? And then what just kind of makes sense for me to buy as a seedling, taking all of that into consideration, not going and buying the like overblown fertilized ones. Yes. Can I just add one point there too? Because I I don't want to make it sound like it's bad to buy seedlings. It's not at all. It's incredibly convenient and simple. (laughs) And you're not having to burn up the elect, not that it takes a lot of electricity, but I mean, there are, there's a lot of reasons why it makes sense to buy a seedling that somebody else already starts for you. Mm -hmm. But for those of us who have started seeds or think about wanting to do it, to me, there's just, there's nothing better and a million reasons why it makes sense to do it. But it doesn't mean that it's not, it's not bad to buy seedlings, not at all. I think too, once you have some plant friends, my first year of seed starting, I started seeds with my friend Melody and we looked at our seed packets together and she decided what she was going to start. And I decided what I was going to start. We both started them in her greenhouse, but you could do this if you have guard, you know, with your local garden club and say, okay, I'm going to do the tomatoes. You're going to do this or whatever. And then we traded and then we shared our harvests all summer. That's fun. uh, That's a gardening buddy. I mean, that's, I love that idea. It was the best. Mm -hmm. And I could totally see myself doing that with some garden friends that I've made up up here this year. Um, Because also some people, one girl is obsessed with growing the dahlias. Mm -hmm. I'm not so obsessed with that. I'm obsessed with growing the tomatoes. You know, like how could we kind of trade and barter with each other? I think that's kind of fun. It is fun because gardening, you know, I don't need, I mean, I like the solitude of gardening. I like listening to the birds while I'm digging in the dirt and and that's mm-hmm. magical to me. But at the same time, it's kind of lonely. You know, there, if a lot yeah. of times you're doing it by yourself and how fun yeah. is it to have that gardening partner or that buddy or that person to share your joys and your challenges with? I think that's a great idea. I really recommend that. And that's why so many people love community gardening or allotment gardening. And, uh, yeah. you know, you make friends and share plants and swap seeds. And I mean, that's what it's all about. Speaking of time in the garden, like alone time in the garden, we just got some wind chimes uh-huh. in our house. Do you have wind Not chimes? Not yet. In I was your thinking garden? about it over the holidays. I keep. I'm me- going to send mm. you a wind chime. Oh, please. 
I, I, I forget to ask for that. You know, people will say, what do you want for Christmas? You know, my family and I like mm-hmm. nothing. I have everything I need. That's the thing I want. I need wind chimes. <gasps> Shout out Wind River. They sent me some uh, wind chimes. I had the most spiritual experience on New Year's Day with my wind chimes looking at the sun. Like they've turned my house into this magical vortex. I can't stand it. Mm. And so that is a beautiful and I love my birds chirping too. Mm -hmm. But that is like, oh my God, the wind chimes are next level garden, like Zen making it this like magical retreat. It's like I have singing bowls all over my house. Yeah. Okay, I digress. So <laughs> seed starting. Okay, so we've decided. We know our garden date. Let's talk about how to read a seed packet. Mm-hmm. Because there's so much information on a seed packet, mm-hmm. and sometimes you don't know what it means. Right. So I'm going to read you what is on the seed okay. packet, and then can you yep. walk me through what I'm supposed to do? Yep. I have some of my seeds that I grew last year. I have... Sugar Daddy Peas, Snap Peas. Mm-hmm. I have my favorite. Have you ever grown blush cherry tomatoes? No, I looked at them today and um, <gasps> yeah. So you recommending They're that, They're huh? so good. Really? They're tie-dye. They're mm-hmm. like tie-dye tomatoes. Yeah, They're incredible. I saw those. We did, um, Billy, this was, we did a taste test uh-huh. when I grew a bunch yeah, of tomatoes yeah. and this was Billy's, my husband's favorite. Ooh. And then I have Green Brigade Salad. Yes. So these are all going to have lots of different information. Okay. So, seed depth. Mm-hmm. Okay, so seed depth, it should give you a quarter of an inch or an <laughs> eighth of an inch. Are you asking me a question oh. or you did not read it yet? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. So, can I – I'll say what it <laughs> okay. is and then I'll, I'll read it okay. and then you'll define, like, what do I need to know when I read seed depth, a quarter inch for the tomatoes. Mm-hmm. But for the peas, it's an inch to an inch and a half. Yep. Okay, so rule of thumb, the larger the seed, the deeper you plant it. And okay. the thing that you inherently should understand about a seed is that the embryo, the living DNA within the seed coat, there's a certain amount of energy there that it has just enough, not too much, not too little, but just the exact amount that it needs to send out the primary root and send up the shoot and no more. Because when the shoot gets up there and the first set of leaves comes out, that's where things take over. That's where the energy from the sun kicks in to provide the plant what it needs from there on. But if you planted that tomato seed that only needs to be planted a quarter of an inch, if you planted that an inch deep, it's going to use up all its energy before it even gets to the surface mm. to get to the sun. So you don't want to plant it too deep. And a quarter of an inch, don't get your ruler out and try to measure a quarter of an inch. A quarter of an inch is basically saying just lightly cover it with soil. Right. There's no way you can precisely do a quarter of an inch, nor do you need to, but it's a guide to say, look, this is a small seed. It doesn't need to go deep, just cover it up slightly. A pea, on the other hand, does need, you know, enough time to send up that shoot while it's still underground and um, send down that root. And if it sprouts too soon, it, it may not, it just may not be hard enough enough. It may not be mature enough if you're planting it too close to the surface. Next thing you know, it's up coming out, breaking the surface of the sun, and it needs more time underground. So that's where it's more important. It's also important. much... Go ahead. And it's also much bigger. Like yeah. The thing that's wild, too, is that all these seeds are so different. They're expressed so differently, and a, and a pea is, so, is visible where a tomato seed is like barely visible. True. Temperature for soil germination. Ooh. These are averaging between 45 to 90 degrees based on what the the seed is, but they're all in that general area. Seeds have a preferred temperature range in which they will germinate. And it can be quite broad. Mm-hmm. It can be 50 degrees between the lowest and the highest temperature of the soil that it needs for that seed to germinate. There's an ideal temperature within that range where they're going to germinate the best and the fastest and the most consistently. Mm-hmm. And so you're targeting the ideal temperature. So let's just take peppers. They can germinate in as cold as maybe 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Maybe it's less than that. I don't know, but it's always warmer for me. But they actually like germinating on up to maybe 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And that seems really hot, but peppers like it hot. So if, mm-hmm. as long as you're within that range, they're going to germinate. And the further away they are from their ideal range, the longer it's going to take or the less consistency you're going to have. But they're still, for the most part, going to germinate. So what you're trying to target is the 
I don't know that the seed packet talks about the ideal temperature. Usually it's the range. Yeah, there's just ranges. Yeah, but we teach about the ideal temperature in the course to help you try to zero in on that. And there's things that you can do with, with heat mats and or germination mats, as they're technically called. But um, that's very important because if you are, for example, lettuce. Lettuce has internal programming inside of itself. That's what internal means. That's redundant. But it has <laughs> it has information that it knows that if it's in, sitting in soil that's higher than 80 degrees Fahrenheit, it's not even going to germinate. It's going to wait mm. and buy time until the soil temperature gets 80 degrees or below so that it can sprout because it knows – I'm anthropomorphizing here, but it knows that if it mm-hmm. were to germinate in a hotter temperature, the plant is inherently going to be more bitter and less tasty, and it's not going – it's it's just not going to thrive as well. So it holds off, and so there's no point in us trying to sow that seed in temperatures that are beyond 80 or or, on the other hand, in temperatures that are cooler than its lowest point. So it's important to know that seed soil temperature. And when it comes to warming soil, I think this was something that I learned about for the first time when I started seed starting because as a houseplant parent or an outdoor gardener, you're not warming your soil. So this was the – I had to buy a heat mat. Can you speak about a little bit what a heat mat is? Well, the the heat mat, which we often – you know, we always call them heat mats, and I just don't want that to be confused with the heat mat that you put on your shoulder, your back to ease your muscles. Right. Although it works, mm-hmm. it's not necessarily waterproof and not probably safe, ultimately. Yeah. So germination mat is really what you're using. And you're not – I mean, you are using it to warm the soil because that's what the temperature – that's what the seed is sensing to to germinate. You know, it's sensing for that proper range of soil temperature. So the germination mat is getting that soil – to that range. And depending on the germination mat that you get, it can be a static temperature that you just plug in and the mat is made to try to produce about a 75 degree Fahrenheit average temperature. But for those who really want to dial in that ideal temperature, you can buy one with a thermostat on it and dial in the temperature that you want that mat to hold. Mm, That ideal temperature. That ideal temperature. And so you're going to spend not much more, but a little bit more to get that precision, but you know, depending on what you're after, that can be well worth it because a good heat mat or German, see, I say it too, a good germination mat is going to last you a long time. And so it's everything that we're talking about as far as equipment, you don't need to spend a lot of money, but don't be afraid to do that because well-made equipment is an investment that will last you potentially a lifetime. So it's just a one-time investment. My first seed starting setup was, I think I shared this on the last podcast we did, but, uh, plastic egg carton mm-hmm. wrapped in cellophane sitting on top of my cramp my menstrual cramps heat mat yep. that was fuzzy yep. sitting on top of a cookie cooler <laughs> cookie like you know the little tray with that you cool your cookies yeah. on to keep the mat <laughs> off of the plate uh-huh. and uh how we didn't burn my apartment down I don't know but I I germinated tomato seeds very successfully yeah. and grew them in my uh grew them in my in my bookshelf but I have to say when I started my first year seed starting, I was kind of annoyed that I had to buy this heating mat because this germination mat, because I was like, I'm mostly house plants. I'm going to buy this thing once and use it once. I cannot believe how many times my germination mat has come into use for me. Mm-hmm. Like I've used it multiple times for multiple different occasions, like to keep some house plants warmer when I was playing around with a humidity experiment. Mm-hmm. I've used it now every season, I mean, every year to start my seeds. So it is a one-time investment that I know can be kind of annoying up front. But I just personally, I used it this weekend because I'm doing little rapid rooter plugs for my hydroponic kit. And I was like, oh, well, if I put these on my germination mat first, it'll probably help them sprout faster so I can just pop them in the the kit to to get the growing start. Yeah. So then all of a sudden you start being like, oh, what are, what other what other things can I hack my my way through with this germination mat, you know? Thanks to Wind River, one of our newest sponsors for supporting the episode, Plant Friend. The magical feeling of hearing the deep resonance of a Wind River chime in your garden is 
honestly incomparable to anything else I've heard. And I know that sounds insane, (laughs) but they're seriously the prettiest sounding chimes I've ever heard. And you hear them singing in the wind throughout the day. And it's like this constant reminder to drop into the present moment. Billy and I have two Wind River chimes. I have one outside of my office. Billy, we have one outside of our kitchen. Throughout the day, the wind blows. The chime represents that wind. And when I hear the chime, it's this reminder to like take a deep breath and drop into myself. It's so beautiful. Plant friend, if you're looking for a new way to grow joy or mindful moments in your life, I can't recommend a Wind River chime enough for you, for your home or your garden or both. I love these chimes so much, I've gone on a little bit of a gifting rampage with them. I gifted my mother-in-law a set of wind chimes for Christmas. She loves wind chimes. They went over so well. And I also engraved the wind chime with her name on it. So it was personalized, which was a really nice touch. And I love that whenever the chime rings, she's going to be able to think of me. And in this episode, you hear Joe and I randomly start talking about the new wind chime obsession of mine. And I'm going to take him up on his offer. So we're going to trade a wind chime for a seed counter. He's definitely winning, but I don't care because it's such a beautiful and joyful gift. So join me in my gifting rampage and gift a Wind River Chime to your loved one, whether it's for a birthday, an anniversary, a holiday, even maybe as remembering a lost loved one. And you should use code GROWINGJOY at windriverchimes.com to get a free engraving to add a special element to your gift. They come in a variety of colors, sizes, and sounds, so head to their website, windriverchimes.com, and don't forget to use code GROWINGJOY to receive a free engraving on all Corinthian Bell's wind chimes. Have you heard of weighted blankets, plant friends? More importantly, have you heard of Barabee weighted blankets, plant friends? I'm going to change your life if you haven't. So I've had a weighted blanket for over three years. I've slept with a weighted blanket for literally every night of my life for almost three years now. And I recently upgraded my old, ugly, hot weighted blanket for a Barabee cooling tree napper. And holy moly, it has been such an upgrade to our bedroom and to my ability to sleep well at night. So if you don't know, Barabee is a sustainable home wellness brand on a mission to create a calmer, more comforted world. Barabee's hand-knit, sustainable weighted blankets help you sleep better and feel calmer naturally. Plus, they're made with entirely sustainable materials such as organic cotton, eco-velvet, and tensile so that you can practice self-care without compromise. It's kind of hard to put, so if you don't know, a weighted blanket is exactly what it sounds like. It's a blanket that's super heavy, and it's kind of hard to put into words the feeling of relief and comfort when you put this blanket on. The Barabee weighted blankets are between 10 to 30 pounds. You put them on, and it feels like the biggest, most coziest and comforting hug. It's like immediate relaxation when this weighted blanket hits you. So I upgraded my weighted blanket to Barabee because it solved two problems that I had as a weighted blanket user. One, my old weighted blanket was so hot. It was an old school weighted blanket. It had beads in it and it basically just like trapped the heat, my body heat. And I'm a hot sleeper. So this new tree napper has this gorgeous, really beautiful to look at also chunky knit that allows for airflow. So it's cooling. And then number two, my old blanket was so ugly. (laughs) It's gray and not cute at all. And the Barabee blankets are so beautifully designed. They really just look like any kind of gorgeously, you know, styled knit throw blanket that you would see on, you know, in any magazine, but they have this healing weighted technology in it. So it's incredible. They come in a couple of different materials, their original cotton napper, the cooling tree napper, which is what I have for my sweaty self, and they even have a fancy-looking velvet napper if you want to get real fancy, and the velvet napper is made out of ocean-bound plastic bottles. Treat yourself, plant friends. Treat yourself to a gift of a weighted blanket during these cozy winter months. You will not be disappointed. A weighted blanket has completely transformed the way I sleep. Use code GROWINGJOY at checkout at barabee.com for free, faster shipping. Once again, grab your weighted blanket at barabee.com and use code GROWINGJOY for free, faster shipping. One tip there, if you if someone's going to buy a germination mat, you know they come in different sizes, and a lot of times we we gravitate to the single tray size. It's ten inches by twenty inches, basically. That's a standard tray, mm-hmm. and there's a mat made to go just under that one tray. But you know that may cost you fifteen dollars, let's say, 
But if you look, sl- you know, scroll over one notch, you're going to find that they make mats of different sizes, like for four trays side by side. And it's only mm-hmm. $8 more. And it's like, yeah. buy that, buy that, because chances are you're not yeah. only going to, you're not just going to sew one tray. You're probably going to sew two to four. And mm-hmm. you're going to wish that you had had a heat mat for every one. So just get the one that holds four mats at a time and you save yourself a bunch of money and a lot of frustration. Mm-hmm. Last year, I got real creative hmm. with, okay, if I have the heat mat running lengthwise, but then I put <laughs> the trays running this, I was like, how can I get a little bit of heat on each one? And then I would rotate the, I was, I, I was losing my mind last yeah. year with my gardener's itch. I'll probably buy another germination mat. I, and I have the three tray one, but I just, I was, I was, I did too much last <laughs> year. But anyway, okay. So what about days to germination? That's another thing mm-hmm. that we see on these. And days to germination can vary. Huh. So you can start seeds and think that your seeds won't germinate. And then they're going to surprise you two weeks in. It's a guideline. And it's only a guideline. And, yeah. and a lot of times yeah. your seeds, if they're fresh seeds and you've stored them well, and you've got the right growing environment, and the soil temperature is the right range. It's you're um, you're going to probably see those germinate faster than what is on the seed packet. Conversely, if it doesn't germinate by the time that it says expect it to germinate, according to that number on the mm-hmm. packet, that's a heads up for you to start looking and thinking. Okay, you know, the longer away past that date is. Then you start to ask yourself, well, what's going on here? You know, and and don't throw in the towel just because you're a week past the date on the seed pack. But mm-hmm. that is telling you that, hmm, what's going on here? Because your seeds might be too old or that you might have planted them too deep. The soil might be too wet. There can be a number of reasons why seeds don't germinate. But one of the tools that we have to help us understand that there may be an issue of concern is the expected days to germination that's provided on the inf- the seed pack. You mentioned seeds still being good. Uh-huh. How do I know if my seeds are still good if I've had seeds that have been in a packet for a couple of years? Well, most seeds will last for a couple of years, no problem, with the exception of just a few. Lettuce doesn't last that long and carrots doesn't last that long. But you know, the general rule is that you can get by with seeds that have been sitting in a pack for two years, no problem, as long as the humidity and the air temperature when you add the air temperature right. and the humidity together, the number is 100 or less. That's your rule of thumb that tells you that the environment that those seeds have been stored in is okay. Now, ideally, you want drier air and cooler temperatures. So if you store your seed in an airtight container with maybe a little um, silica pack, or you could even put the seeds in a freezer, uh, then they're going to last indefinitely, literally decades and or longer like the okay. seed banks mm-hmm. thousands of years so so you can do a viability test maria if you're unsure and you want to know before you sow a bunch of seeds into a tray take 10 of those seeds out of that packet dampen up a paper towel a couple layers of paper towel line up 10 of those seeds fold the damp paper towel over and around them put them in a ziploc bag put a date on when you did this and set mm-hmm. them on top of a warm environment for a few days, you know, around the dates that it says it should take for germination. And then take the pack to un- undo the bag, open up the paper towels, look and see if they've started to sprout. And if nine of the 10 have started to sprout, then you got 90% germination efficacy. Five of 10, 50%. And that tells you, first of all, that the seeds are still good, but they're not great. And that if you're sowing those seeds, you need to sow more to get the number that you're trying to ultimately plant. That brings us to thinning and how many you sow together. What is your general advice for when I'm starting seeds in my little containers, how many seeds I put in each cell? I I try, you know, if I have ample seeds, I always do at least two and sometimes okay. three. And I don't, I don't, I'm not so anal that I, you know, if I accidentally sow three and I only meant to do two, I hunt down that third seed right. and take it out unless I need to. <laughs> I hope uh, not. Yeah. Yeah. You're sowing too many seeds to do that. Yeah. So, um, one to three, and and sometimes the seeds are so small, like with brassica, like broccoli or herb seeds are, are like practically like grains of dust. And uh, you can't help but sow a lot of seeds into that little space. So when they're germinating, mm-hmm. you're going to get a lot of sprouts. And then it's a matter of with, with certain herbs, you can plant them in bunches or clusters. 
some like tomatoes, mm-hmm. you might you don't want to plant two right growing together. You want to thin them down to one. And then the next plant that's in the garden is about two feet away from that. So it depends on what you're growing, but you ultimately want to thin them down. And if we want to talk about joy and wellness, thinning, no one likes to thin plant friends. It's a hard practice, but you got to do it because if you're like me in the first year, you didn't thin because you didn't want to cut the plants. It ruins. It's not in the long run. You're going to ruin both plants. You've got to sacrifice one for the future. You're not doing yourself any favors by not thinning. It is the hardest thing. It's the toughest of tough love to cut away perfectly beautiful, good seedlings. You know, you've got two seedlings side by side and they both are equally gorgeous And you're having to make the decision on which one goes and which one stays. And it never gets easy. Never gets easy. But you can eat them as microgreens. Most most, of them. A lot of them. You know, you can eat them. But yeah, we're, you know, word to the wise about thinning. So in terms of materials, we've gone over heat mats. For someone who might be starting their seed starting journey for the beginning, you know, for the first time, what are the non-negotiables that I need? And then what are the would be nice that I need. So the non-negotiables, uh, you know, the heat mat isn't, isn't even a non-negotiable. It's an option. It's, it's, it's a nice to have. It's not a need to have unless you are in a place where it's really cold all the time and you're not going to get soil temperatures warm enough, then you need it. Mm -hmm. But for most of us in a controlled environment setting, you don't have to have a germination mat. It's going to take you a day or two or three longer for them to germinate, but they're going to germinate. So you can save money there. When I I did an experiment one year years ago on starting a garden to feed my family of four for the entire summer and spend less than twenty five dollars to do it, and oh right by the end of the summer I had only spent fifteen dollars and five cents for the most prolific garden I ever had. Today Show and Good Morning America picked it up and and they were all into it. But anyway, the way I did it, I mean, because it was like kind of a novel idea, but I needed to show people that they could do it. And I had to pretend that I was Mm -hmm. a brand new gardener that didn't have any tools or equipment. Even though I owned all of that stuff, I couldn't use it because I wanted to put myself Mm -hmm. in the shoes of the brand new first time seed starter. Pizza boxes can supplement your seed starting trays. So you could spend a few bucks on some professionally made seed starting trays, but all you're really doing with that is finding a place to contain some soil and sow your seeds. So anything that has drainage and is about two inches in height to hold the soil will work. But uh, the drainage is key and you have to have something on top of it to hold the moisture or the humidity in. And so you can buy the professional clear plastic domes. They're called humidity domes, but you can also use plastic wrap and just lay it across the top or a sheet of glass or clear plastic, something that just allows light through but doesn't let the humidity out. And then um, soil. Soil, here's a non-negotiable. Here's the first non-negotiable, really, and that is good sterile seed starting mix. You need light, well-draining, but moisture-retentive seed starting mix that doesn't have the risk of pathogens in it, diseases that can spread to your seeds and cause death as they germinate through a damp, a t- mm-hmm. called a damp, damp, it's a fungal dis- degree, fungal disease commonly known as damping off. But um, mm-hmm. sterile seed starting mix doesn't have that risk. So that would be important. And then light. In your course, I want to say a tip you had given that was so helpful is dampening your seed starting mix before you plant your seeds. That was in your course, right? Because I can't tell you how many times you set everything out nice, you place your seeds exactly where they're supposed to be, and then if you water it, the water bubbles up, the seeds sit on top, and then you've completely messed up your planting. So pre-moistening that soil because it is a little drier because it's sterile up front I think is important. That's a really good point because a lot of the sterile seed starting mix is peat-based. Peat is hydrophobic, meaning it does not imbibe water easily. It doesn't take it in. So that bag of peat-based seed starting mix, when you put it into the tray and you go to add the water, like you just said, Marie, it sits on top and you think it's never going to drain down. And if you sowed Mm -hmm. your light little tomato seeds on top, they oftentimes will just float out of that cell. Just float right out. And so so, uh, thoroughly moisten it, like just dump the bag out into a bucket and Mm -hmm. saturate the bucket because it's going to absorb all of that water. And then you don't have to worry about water. Just put your seed in on top, slightly dust over the top of it with a little bit more, and you're off to the races. Mm-hmm. Totally. Mm. 
Lights. Let's talk about lights. Another product I was so annoyed to have to buy for my seed starting because you know me and my grow lights. I have beautifully aesthetic grow lights that fit my house so nicely. You never know they're grow lights. And then I had to buy these, you know, grow lights that you have to hang on these strings. Like they're not pretty. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've used them for random things. Like because they're so um, like industrial, they're just so useful. You can just prop them up. The fact that they have the string that you can like lower and and raise. They're I with my house plants and with my seed starting. Just another purchase that I'm just I can't believe how much use I've gotten <laughs> out of these ugly seed starting lamps that you know I've used. The lighting can be the most intimidating part of the whole process, but let me just put yeah. everybody's mind at ease there. It doesn't have to be that at all, because if you had a south facing sunny window, you can get by with that. It's not quite enough. Seeds prefer to have more light than what a south facing window will provide, even if it's all day light. That said, a lot of people do it and it works. But for the most part, the seedlings are leggier, which means they're taller and thinner and they're yeah. searching for the light. And that's not as good for the plant. So you want to supplement the light, but here's where it can be easy for you to not be intimidated. You can go to Home Depot or Lowe's or Target or whatever and buy a shop light. They're self-contained units that you can hang by chains or it even comes with a chain, sits over your tray. It's just fluorescent tubes or LED tubes that do the job. Yeah. Are they the most efficient, best light for your seedlings? No. But do the, do will they do the job? Absolutely, positively they will. And I, I have so many different types of grow lights because I I trial them and I test them. I'm always in the know on what. It's a great module in yeah. your seed starting course. I love that. module. Thank you. But I also showed in that module that you you know I used shop lights, the cheapest twenty dollars shop mm -hmm. light that you can get by with, and successfully grew out tons of seedlings. It looked close to as good as my much more expensive grow lights. So lighting, That's lighting's important. The distance, Invest $20 yeah. in a shop light, if nothing else. I think the kits I bought, they were specific seed starting kits. Mm -hmm. They were like 60 to $80. I think maybe they were even on sale and they came with the bar set up. That was, I feel like the easiest thing. It was worth the extra $20 or whatever I spent because it came with the, the T frame yeah. for it. It came with the ropes, the setup, the light had a timer on it, but it was still affordable because it was a T bulb and sorry, it was a bulb. What are they called? Fixed, uh, 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 the, is it a tube? Was it a tube or just a, a tube? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a light tube, a fluorescent tube. Yeah. It was LED a tube, tube, a fluorescent mm -hmm. tube but not LED. Okay. So it was cheaper because it was still a tube, yeah. but, um, they work great. Yeah. I just can't get over it. And they're just like, so, so functional. So I definitely think lights for most indoor growers are probably necessity. I mean, they're definitely necess a necessity are. for me. I'd say they are. Yeah. So we covered soil, we covered light, uh, we covered, Oh, do you use one of those, you know, the seed, uh, tools that you can put all your seeds in and then it, disperses yeah. them for you or love do you that. just use your no fingers? i love that seed dispenser i use it all the you time do? it's a dollar i mean it's is it a dollar yeah they're about a dollar so you go on amazon you got five okay. packs you see them in packs of five for about five dollars you know now with covid okay. and supply chains probably it's gone up to seven Who knows? but still right. they right. i mean they last forever but they have a place to hold all your, you can dump the whole pack of seeds into this little bowl Little circular thing. Yeah, yeah, and it has a clear lid on top with different openings so you can d dial in the proper opening so that you can tap, 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 and the little seeds disperse out the opening down a little chute that has ridges on it to slow the fall of the seed. And then you can pre mm -hmm. almost preci precisely disperse one, two, or three seeds into each cell. And it's a beautiful mm -hmm. thing. And I use it every time for every seed pretty much. Except for the big stuff. The big stuff you, is, is easier to get by with just doing it by hand. But most of the big stuff I'm direct yeah. sewing outside. I'm not even using a little tool. Right. Okay. So we've talked about the setup. We've moistened our soil. We've 
put our seeds in either with that cool tool or with our fingers. I still use my fingers. Got to graduate. Maybe that's what I'll treat myself to this year, this spring. You send um, me wind chimes. Big, I'll send you a seed that. dispersal tool. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Great. Yeah. <laughs> totally that's fair, fair, right? Totally fair trade off. <laughs> <laughs> totally fair. Um, so we've got it all set up. We've got it on our heat mat. We've got the lights. Uh, how do you water your seedlings? I do a self-irrigating system that I kind of came up with. I probably didn't, I know I didn't invent the initial concept. I just refined what I'd seen, I think, at some point. And uh, it's a self-watering system. So in short, you could create a reservoir of water using a solid tray under your seed tray that is mm-hmm. supported the seed tray is supported by, I use these white PVC pipes to just keep it from just providing some space so that when they're sitting on top of the PVC tubes and there's a piece of felt under the seed tray, it wicks up water in the reservoir and, and pulls it all the way through. And so the seed tray is sitting on that wet piece of felt. Actually, it's two pieces of felt is what it takes for me. And the water is drawn up into the cells through the little openings at the bottom of the seed tray sufficiently to keep the soil just moist enough so that the entire cell is allowing the seed to do what it needs to do with the water to germinate. So that was probably more than we wanted to get into as far as how do I water, but that is how (laughs) I water. But that said, a simple watering can with very a very fine, Florette, the part that sticks on the top of the watering mm-hmm. can that has tiny little holes to create the gentlest of drops is what you want because you yeah. don't want to dislodge the seeds. Once they're in there, you want to be careful That's about the worst. that. Yeah. So um, That's the worst yeah. thing when you do that. And you're keeping the soil evenly mm-hmm. moist, right? Yeah. This isn't a moment where you let your seedlings dry it out. I've let seedlings dry out before, and it's so heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah. You know, a lot of them are resilient. You can water them, and they'll pop right back up. But seedlings are not like house plants that, you know, you can kind of let the soil dry out and trust that they'll bounce back. And in the seed part, once, once the germination process begins, you know, a seed mm-hmm. can sit around for years and years and years and never germinate because the conditions haven't been right. But one of the conditions mm-hmm. that is right, well, the conditions that are right are, you know, temperature, moisture, and things that happen to the seed coat sometimes that allow water to come in. But once all the conditions align, the germination process begins. And once it starts, it mm-hmm. can't stop. But it depends on a consistent amount of moisture once it starts for the germination process mm-hmm. to complete. And if you let the right. soil dry out before the seed has germinated, there's a good chance that that seed's just going to die before it ever has a chance to do what it was meant to do. So the most important time is keeping the soil moist before it germinates. And we talked about that clear plastic cover, that germination dome or that plastic wrap. That's, that's where this comes into play. So importantly is that's what's holding the moisture in the soil to keep it moist enough, long enough for the seed to germinate. I love it when you start to see that evaporation oh, at the yeah. top of the plastic. That's a good sign. And it's like a whole little rainforest in yeah. there. Okay, cool. And then I, we're at an hour already. I do want to ask you, are there any classic beginner mistakes that you would want to forewarn our newest seed starters about? I think overwatering or underwatering are the biggest mistakes. Uh, watering mm. is is the tricky I guess I would say it's the trickiest part of the seed germination process because we either under or over water. But if you Mm -hmm. find a way to create a self-watering system or you can buy kits that have the seed tray, the solid tray, and a little stand and a a Mm -hmm. wicking fabric that has everything all together for you. And it's $12, I think, at Greenhouse Megastore. I mean, it's and it's 24 cells. Mm-hmm. I love those things. And I have a bunch of them because they're super easy. But that way, you don't have to worry about, am I doing too much or too little? It's It happens on its own. But that'd be the, that would be the mm-hmm. biggest thing that I can think of or not providing enough light um, would be the other thing because then the seedlings either get too leggy or, well, they get too leggy. Oh, and the other thing we didn't talk about, which is my beginner's rookie mistake is not having a fan. 
Do you want to just do a quick, yeah. w- just the importance of having a fan? It's a, it's an, it's an important thing to have. It's not a must have because if you're using sterile seed starting mix, there's a good chance that the pathogens aren't even going to show up because there's no pathogen to begin with. That said though, the fan is important still because that air circulation is mimicking nature. And the more that we can do to mimic nature, Mm -hmm. the better off that plant is going to be overall. So even in the absence of avoiding the risk of damping off, providing air circulation is very proactive for keeping that plant healthier and tougher. And that hardening off that you mentioned earlier, it just makes it more ready to get outside. Uh, my, my old plant friend, Melody, the woman who I started my plants with the first Mm -hmm. year, she said that she used to pet her Hmm. plants. She used to pet all of her seedlings. Mm -hmm. Like she'd run Mm -hmm. her hand across the Hmm. top of all of the seedlings in order to mimic wind at least once a day. Obviously that's not a fan running at all times, but I thought that was so sweet. It was like, that was her way of connecting with her. Well, and the added bonus to that, for those who know what I'm about to say, if you love the smell of tomato seedlings, when you (gasps) you rub your (sighs) hands over the top of those little seedlings and you smell your hand, it's like, that's like heaven. I've got to find that cologne because I know it's out there. Tomato seedling cologne. You know, I've seen, um, I've seen tomato candles and I've yet, and I haven't tried them all, but I've smelled every tomato candle when I'm at the store and I've yet to find a true tomato scent yet. I, I love this idea and I would be the first to buy it. So if you know, if you're listening and you know a good tomato scented candle, please let me know because I'll, I'll buy them out. Okay. We have to wrap up, but speaking of seedlings, Joe, I can't, let you leave before I ask you about your insane greenhouse mm. you just installed. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about what are, I mean, your seed starting life is probably going to greatly change now that you have this literally house. It's a green house it's a building. on yeah. your property. It's a, it's a full building. I'm so excited. I've been following on Instagram. Go, f- go check this thing out. It's enormous. Tell us about it. I have wanted a greenhouse for Years and years and years. I don't know how many, but it's been a long time. It's kind of crazy that you don't have one. Here's why. I've seen a lot of greenhouses and I've had the opportunity to get greenhouses for free. And mm-hmm. for me, I was waiting for the one that looked right for me. Uh, I wanted a beautiful, sturdy structure that fit with, in my case now, I've been on my farm for 10 years. It's got a look, you know, it's got, it's a farmy, yeah. aesthetic, rustic, rustic look. Mm-hmm. And I wanted something, a structure that mimicked that, that fit in, that seemed seamless there. And a few years ago, I was on Instagram and Jill McSweeney had a uh, greenhouse from Yoderbelt, which is the company. And I thought, mm-hmm. or McSheehy, I said, I'm sorry, Jill, if you're listening to this. Um, but anyway, I saw that and I said, that's the one. That's the, that's the look I'm looking She's for. She's the one. So I, tra- I asked Jill, who, who's that company? And I contacted them and I said, how do I order one of these? And I got the information. And next thing you know, or not next thing, you know, two years later, <laughs> and a lot of red right. tape through city government to get approval on where to put it. Oh, I right. have it. And um, I'm, I am so, you know, it came in the week after Christmas. I mean, like like the best Christmas present to me ever. And for me, you know, I bought myself a nice, beautiful greenhouse, mm-hmm. 32 feet by 12 feet. But anyway, it's, um, it's going to, it's going to be my playground for the rest of my life. I love starting seeds anyway. And now I have a better, bigger place to do it. I'm not going to abandon my indoor seed starting room because that has unique benefits as well. But, um, and you've made quite an investment oh my gosh. <laughs> for it yeah. too. Your seed starting room, if you take his, uh, seed starting course, the seed starting room is, is extremely impressive. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's nice, but anyway, so I've got my greenhouse now. I I, I has I got it last Thursday, you know, a few days ago, and I haven't really even gotten it dirty yet. And uh, I'm about to, mm-hmm. and uh, I will be sewing a lot of stuff in there, and I can't wait. And I'll be showing everybody everything I do because I just I, a lot of people are curious, and I want to share that information. But I'm so excited. Thanks for asking, because um, yeah. I'm so excited and so jealous. I'm so excited for you and so jealous of you. I hope you like host a cocktail party. <laughs> like once it's once the greenhouse is all set up, like I hope you entertain in it. It's it's big enough that you could like I feel like host a wedding in there. But go check out Joe Gardner, your socials. But more importantly, 
if this episode has inspired you, I can't mm. endorse your seed starting course more. I've literally taken mm, it two or three times you. now. Tell us about the yeah. course. If people are interested in starting seeds with you alongside you, alongside me and the special offer that we have. For yeah. You. Um, Maria, this course, Master Seed Starting, I, I did, I created, I think in 2019 at first. And, um, because I love seed starting so much. And I knew that there were a lot of questions out there about it. So I dove in and literally spent a couple of years developing the course uh, so that when we launched it, it was really, really comprehensive. And judging from the feedback from all the students now that it's been out for years or several years, they're over the top with it. And it's our best selling course. Uh, I, I'm very proud of it. You've taken it, you know. Uh, and I don't it's know what else I could put in there, you know. But when we think of something, we add it. That's the yeah. cool thing about it. So it's um, many productive hours of time that teach you everything that you need to know about how to start seeds indoors and outdoors. And every, every aspect that we talked about today, Maria, that's just scratching the surface of what we go into. So it's video based. We use our television crew that I have for my TV show to film a lot of the things that we demonstrate for the course, along with, you know, lectures that I do sort of in a PowerPoint, you know, so it's a good combination and it's lifetime access and it's, we continue to update it. And, um, I highly recommend it and it's a great deal. And then we do office hours. We, we help you through the growing season by answering your questions in real time and periodic office hour sessions. So you can't beat it. And, um, I'm very happy about it. And your community, I, I feel like I always talk about this, but I'm in your, you used to have a Facebook group. Now it's on circle, yeah. but do you still get access to your circle community? If when you take affiliate, oh yeah, yeah, seed, yeah. Uh, sorry, when you take seed starting, yeah. so your Facebook group, like your office hours, are incredible. The fact that I, I feel like I've, I think I've been to your office hours before and asked you stuff, but your community, like I will post a question in your community and get so many yeah. responses. Um, and this is where it's weird for me because I'm like I'm your student, but also you're my friend. But I also can't say enough of good things. And the lifetime access is interesting because for me. I've gone back to the course every year and I've learned something new every year. And this year, when I probably am going to amp up my seed starting, I'm going to go back with a totally different eye from the last mm -hmm. two years that I've gone in is like, oh my God, how do I just get them yeah. started? Like, how do yeah. I just do this correctly the first time? This time I'm probably going to rewatch it and say, okay, let's get the fan. Let's get the seed counter. Mm -hmm. Like, let's, let's take this to the next level. Let's buy the next you know, germination mat and you have, you know, all of your recommendations. So if you join the course through the link that I have, Joe's offering a hundred dollars off, which is insane. And, uh, I'm going to host a zoom call for whoever buys through my links for a kickoff mm -hmm. call. Uh, we'll talk about what seeds we've started and just have like a fun zoom call with the listeners in our community to chat about, you know, what seeds we're starting, what we're excited, our, our wins and our losses. So if you want a hundred dollars off, which feels insane, uh, check yeah, the link in my show. That's shout -outs. a good deal. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for the sweet deal. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. and I'm excited to take the class again good. this year. I'm gl glad to have you back in there. Cool. And, uh, Joe Gardner on all your socials and your website, yep. right? For if people want to find you across all your other platforms. Yeah. At Joe Gardner is going to find me pretty much everywhere. One way or another, it's Joe Garden or something, but usually just at Joe Garden or will get me, especially on Instagram, which is where I'm hanging out the most. Cool. Yeah. Go check out his Instagram so you can see his unbelievable greenhouse. It's, it's drool worthy <laughs> for sure. Well, thanks again, Joe. I'm excited. You'll be back on later yep. this season for some more gardening content, yep. but uh, thanks again and congrats. Thanks, Maria. It's fun to talk to you. Special shout out. Thank you very much, Joe, for this amazing conversation. I love him. Joe has been a friend and mentor of mine for many years. I love catching up with him. I'm very much looking forward to trying to send him a Wind River chime. <laughs> we'll see which one he gets for his garden. So if you're interested in taking the next step and taking Joe's course, Joe is offering us $100 off of his course. So his course is $347. He's offering you $100 off if you click through my affiliate link. That's an insane deal. And you get lifetime access. Like I said, I take the course almost every year. I'll definitely go back to the course and review again when I start Seeds this year. It's so 
useful. I really can't say enough about it. If you are interested in learning how to start seeds and you want real support and real education, um, you know, that goes beyond what an hour podcast can do, look no further than Joe's course. Plus, if you click the link, if you go through my affiliate link, you'll get $100 off. And then I'm also going to gift everyone who clicks through my affiliate link a free month membership to my garden society, my app, my community app, and also a live call with me where we're going to sow seeds of intention for our 2023 garden. So if you want it, it's available to you. Also, speaking of promotions, my friend Jessica Zweig, she's the writer of B, a no bullshit guide to increasing your self-worth and net worth by simply being yourself. She is number one, her book, which I have read multiple times. I recommend Jessica's book to everyone I know. Anytime an entrepreneur comes to me and asks for coaching or advice, I say, go read Jessica's book first and then come back and talk to me because your branding is so important. It's incredible. She's launching the paperback. The paperback version of her book has launched last week and she's launching a expand your brand three day challenge. So you can go to simplybeagency.com slash challenge to join. It's going to be a three day challenge with Jessica on how to expand your brand, get seen and grow. And it's totally free. So if you're interested in doing that, click the link below. All right, plant friends, that is enough housekeeping for today. I hope you have enjoyed this episode as much as I had. I love Joe. So thankful to him. Thanks to our sponsors. Support our sponsors and support yourselves and try starting seeds this year, plant friends. It's so fun. I swear you're going to love it. I currently started some seeds in my hydroponic grow tower that I have my lettuce grow farm stand. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll have seen that already. Um, And I'm just loving watching the germination. So I can't wait to once again dive into it in March when I start seeds for my garden this year. All right, plant friends, I hope you have beautifully planty weeks. I hope you find time to connect with your houseplants and nature in order to connect with yourself. And until next time, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. 
And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plan Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. (music) 